Last week on Fill in the Blanks. There was this very, very sad study that asked the question of what percentage of Americans die too early because they've made bad decisions. And the results show that this number is increasing all the time. And the question is why? Are we becoming dumber? The answer is no. What is happening is that the environment is becoming better at tempting us. Think about donuts. Donuts are really getting better. And, right. and what I mean by getting better is not that they're getting healthier, they're getting more tempting. Right. Facebook is becoming better. Our phones are becoming better at tempting us. Cigarettes, texting while driving. The economy around us is an economy of temptation. And we fail, and we fail a lot. Welcome back to part two of what controls your decisions may shock you. We did a study after the 2007-2008 crisis and we reminded people about that crisis. And just reminding them about that crisis made them feel more entitled, right? Bankers took from me, I can take from, from somebody else. So, so if you think that uh, the term adversarial is, is good, if you think that you are against an evil entity, right, then, then you're, it's much, much easier for you to justify this. If you think that everybody is behaving this way, um, I, I don't know uh, if you've been on online dating sites, Yes. We deal with them all the time on the show because of the catfish and the different stealing of identities. And we've dealt with these a lot. Yeah. So, so you know, the moment, the moment uh, people are lying about their age and weight and height and all kinds of things, it becomes the standard and people don't feel they're, uh, they're cheating uh, anymore. But by the way, it's a, it's, a, it's a real question in society. You know, these days... Uh, when we think about the, the pandemic, I think trust is incredibly important, right? We need to trust people that what they tell us is the right information. Right. And, and when, we, when we start playing with the truth and when we start feeling that the entities that are around us are adversarial and not, don't have our best interest in mind, uh, that, that really shakes, shakes some of the basic fabric of collective, positive collective action. But what have you learned about this? Because from a purely psychological standpoint, it would be psychopathic or narcissistic. People that go on a dating site and they show a picture that was 30 pounds in 10 years ago to attract more males or females, depending on what their target is, they know that this is going to hit the wall because if they do get a hit, they get an attraction, they go to a meeting, they know they're going to be barely recognizable when they show up. So they know it's going to hit a wall that, okay, I can show A and then present B. So I am going to have to come clean. They're going to see the difference. How do they justify that and ignore the fact that they're going to have to pay the piper? They're going to have to come clean eventually. Yeah, so, so there are two things that happen. One is that if you had that happen to you, you start believing that other people do it as well. Yeah. Right? So, so he you know, or she's that, not going to show up looking that way either. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's, that's one of the things about the slippery slope of society, right? So if, if, if somebody disappointed you with, with their picture, uh, now, now you, you are disappointing. So that's one. The second thing is Russianization. I had one person came to me and said, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm 40, but I really feel like I look 36. So wouldn't it be actually more honest to say 36 because it's a better description exactly. of, of what I am? But, yeah. So that's the second thing. And, and the third one is that people are hopeful that if the other person would only get give a chance to to know the real them, they will fall in love with them, and and that's a that I think is a, first of all it doesn't work, um, and of course the gap between expectation and reality is is off putting, so people don't give them a, a real chance, but there is this belief uh, for for some people that the real self is better than the observed self from the picture and and look it's it's a tough it's a tough world uh, going on online dating you know i 
you know, personally, I, I look kind of strange, right? So, so if I if I had to go on online dating, um, you know, it will be it will be tough. It will be tough. And if all the world sees you uh, just based on your picture, like so, so I'm, I'm I'm just talking about myself now. But you know, if if I thought that all the world saw was just my picture, and they judge me based on that, and you know, I had. Uh, this is more extreme, but you know, I had people who talked slowly to me because they thought I couldn't comprehend. People make all kinds of association based on how we look right. on other things. So, so imagine somebody who doesn't look that good. And, and the world of online dating has become more and more about looks. Uh, and now you say, how do, you get, how do I get my other attributes to shine? This platform is not allowing that to come through uh, so what they're saying is, let me get them to a meeting. Let me just get them to a meeting and th they'll see the real me. The problem is that strategy doesn't work. But if I had uh, the power, I would change the dating platform. I would try to make the dating platform less about just looks and, and include more attributes and force people to have a slightly deeper process. Because that superficial process, by the way, if you think that looks is the initial screening, it's leaving a lot of wonderful people out there uh, without without uh, romantic love. Yeah, I get you. With a head like mine, I would still be single if it was all. <laughs> just, I've been bald since I was twelve, so it would it wasn't exactly. And yeah. I grew up when hair gods were in in the eighties and stuff, seventies and eighties <laughs> when everybody had big hair. And I was bald, so it would have been tough for me on dating sites back in that day. Yeah, we, we actually calculated that. So, so we, we, we got a lot of data from a, an online dating site, and we could ask the question of what different attributes are worth it, are worth. So, for example, I've, I'm 5'9". And I could say, uh, if I wanted to be as attractive as a 5'10 person, uh, somebody who's one inch taller, uh, how much more money would I have to make a year <laughs> to make up for that? And it turns out it's a lot. Oh, really? It's, oh, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's uh, it's it's over twenty thousand dollars. Really? What did you find inch. out about baldness? Uh, I I don't want to tell you, but it's very. You have to make lots of money to make up for baldness. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> I bet it's a lot more than twenty thousand. It's more. It's more. But but you know, it's it's not just because people and women are superficial. I mean, we are, but it's not just because of that. It's also because these platforms direct us. We talked about choice architecture. If, if, a, if a platform asks you, what's the height of your desired person? And you say 5'10", you'll never see a lovely 5'9 person. If you, have, you say, I don't want to see bald people, you'll never see somebody who's lovely and, and bald. So the technology is actually redirecting our choices in ways that are not always uh, easy for us to understand and, and understand the consequences uh, of that. So once we understand that, we need to redesign platforms in a better way. Yeah, and again, that's how people don't understand that they can default themselves out of choices, opportunities, where they might miss good experiences, good people, good opportunities, by structuring themselves out, they might miss me because I'm bald, but they would also miss Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. You know, mm -hmm. he's bald too. And they say, oh my God, you know, here's one of the most handsome movie stars in the world because they have something prefixed in their mind that motivates them. Let's talk about motivation for a second because that's the thing that really intrigued me about your work to start with. And I'll give you the very short version of this, but when I was 12 years old, I played on a football team that had great equipment and we played the Salvation Army team that had nothing. They had no equipment, no football shoes. They had to play in blue jeans and we played a scrimmage game with us and they beat us like a drum. I remember getting in the car and saying to my dad, what the hell happened? And this was in the seventh or eighth grade, and he looked at me and he said, well, boy, you just got your ass handed to you on a platter. And I said, Dad, I was looking for a little more deep insight than that. And he said, those boys were hungry. They were hungry. And 
I was envious of those kids who had nothing. I said, I want inside what they have. I want that drive. If they can do so much with so little, what should I be able to do with so much at the time? Now, a few years later, I was homeless, but at that point, I actually had a home and football gear, and I was doing fairly well, but my dad was an alcoholic, and things went to hell. But at that point, I thought, those kids who have so little have so much drive. I was actually envious of them, and I fastly learned that it's passion and not money that drives people, and your research has shown that getting people to be more productive really isn't about more money. Am I oversimplifying that? Um, it, it's both yes and no. It's, uh, it's absolutely right. I mean, we find lots of things. I mean, you know, there's, it's, it's worth a, a long discussion about motivation because motivation is so mysterious. Uh, there's so many things that motivate us. Uh, we get motivated by helping others and writing books and running marathons and climbing mountains and inventing new things and helping other people. Motivation is really kind of mysterious and magical. And money is, is one of those things. And money ends up being really curious. Like uh, sometimes it motivates us, sometimes it demotivates us. In the example we gave before that you're coming to my house for dinner and giving me $40, that would demotivate me to invite you in, in a second time. So, you know, there's, there's lots to say, but I would say the following. We did a study on about 1,400 companies during COVID. And we asked the question of what was the, the one, what were the things that got companies to really get the most out of their employees? And we looked, we looked at the, the stock market return of these companies. So we asked lots of, lots of companies questions, their employees, and, we, and then we looked at what was the stock market return. And the number one thing was feeling appreciated. And, and if you think about a person working and you say to what extent that this person cares, it needs to be reciprocal. We want people to care. We want the, the workplace to say, we care too. And thank you so much. And it turns out that, that appreciation was always important, even before COVID. But during COVID, when people are working from home, it's extra important. Why? Because people are away and, and they have to, it's, it's tougher to work from home that's from the office and we have to overcome all kinds of obstacles. So, so things like understanding that the company wants your long-term best interest, uh, feeling appreciated, having your voice heard, all of those things end up being incredibly important. Yeah, we've got 85% of our staff working from home now and they have lots of Zoom meetings where they see each other on screen and all, but the interaction that they have, the non-work related interactions. You know, they'll work, they're planning a show, they're doing research, they're discussing guests, et cetera. But then that 15 minute break or that 10 minutes an hour where they go off task and ask about each other's kids or they look at each other's pictures or what they wore that day, or they tell stories, or they walk down to the corner to get a cup of coffee. It's that social bonding time that is really, really missing, and they miss it. I see you every day, but I miss being with you. It's that human contact and connection and warmth. Our kids not being in school, I think that the competitiveness that's dropped out the togetherness. I think all of that is creating a huge developmental gap with the kids that I'm very worried about that. They're not motivated. There's a whole range of topics here because, because you're absolutely right. Um, we are inherently social animals and we're missing a lot. And some of the things we miss, we don't even understand. I'll give you one example. It turns out that when you meet people and you shake their hand, Almost everybody, after shaking a new person's hand, moves their hand and smells it. Now, not directly, not immediately, but in the next few minutes. Uh, you, you probably have never noticed that you, that you do that. No. But they've filmed, they filmed people, and almost everybody does that. And what's interesting is that you can't put your finger on it, 
but we can smell something about other people. We detect things like fear, of course, but we detect lots of things. Now, that's just one example because it's an example of something we don't know that we're missing. There's no smelling people in Zoom. Right. But there's, there's not a lot of things. It's harder to complete each other's sentences. Like you and I, we, we, we know a lot of the same topics. And if we were in the same room, the nuances of our facial movements and our nodding would allow us to complete sentences together. And, and right. that's a, a synchrony of our activity. Even the small delay on Zoom is eliminating that. Yes. So we're missing, we're missing a ton of collaborative social cues. And, and I absolutely agree with you that, that it has, of course, it has motivational effects, it has energy effects, uh, but on kids, it's incredibly, incredibly worrisome. There was this old, old research in which they took uh, monkeys and uh, there, there were monkeys that were fed by a, a mother monkey with a wireframe. So she was a, a metal monkey with, with milk. Um, and then there were uh, other ones that had fur. So they were still metal, but they were, they were covered with fur. And the, the monkeys that were fed by the metal uh, monkey mother uh, basically became psychopaths. You know, we need touch and we need uh, hugs. And it's, it's, we don't understand all these mechanisms of oxytocin and uh, calmness and uh, feeling somebody else's uh, heartbeat. But, but it's, it's, it's part of our nature and, and we're depriving ourselves of that, especially if you're single or if you're a kid. That, these, are, these are tough periods. They're very tough periods. And I know for me, I now have a virtual audience instead of a real audience. We've got people that we're you know, piping in and they're in our screens, but they're now behind me. When I'm talking to a guest, I always relied on the audience as kind of a barometer whether I'd made my point or if they were getting the message with me or not with me. Because you look for minimal encouragers, you look for eye contact, you look for an indication that they either understand or agree or disagree. But now that's all behind me. And so I feel like I'm a little bit of an unguided missile in terms of knowing whether it's time to move on. And so the pacing is off. You don't know, do you move on? Do you not move on? And it's, it's just very difficult. Yeah, I always love when I teach. There's some students who are nodders, right? Uh, you know, they, they, you, and and I always look at them much more and pay much more attention to them. I mean, you, we crave that feedback. It's it's very natural. Um, when you when you go and uh, do lectures in Europe, the more you go north in Europe, the people are more stoic. Like by the time you get to Finland, they just stand there. They don't laugh at jokes. They, it's very very tough uh, without that without that feedback. Um, and, and it's so intuitive, right? You're not, you're not saying to yourself, what is going on here? It's so intuitive, that feedback loop. Are we on the same wavelength? How are they nodding? Is my pace good enough? We, we, we coordinate. It's a, people think that when you talk to an audience, it's a talk, but it's a conversation. But it's a conversation with lots of feedback that is nonverbal, but it's a part of the discussion. When you're talking about COVID-19 right now and getting people to function in this kind of social distance, in some circumstances, lockdown, society, wearing masks, et cetera, what are the biggest challenges that you're having to manage right now? For me, it's loneliness, depression, and this, this feeling of being disengaged from their jobs and the world in general. What are you seeing? Yeah, so I see, I see a lot of the same things. And, you know, a lot of it is like what level of abstraction and detail you want to give it. But I think that one of the, outside of loneliness, I think the second biggest one is that there's no planning. And the third is lack of control. So, you know, control is so important for resilience. Um, you know, even if you think about pain, pain that you inflict on yourself, like by running or uh, doing something, 
there's almost no problem dealing with that. Pain that comes from the outside that we don't know how to predict is very, very different. Um, and COVID has created lots of lack of control. Like it's kind of crazy. We don't decide if we can leave home or not, if our kids will go to school or not, if our job will be open or not. Uh, so many things are out of our control. Can we travel? Can't we travel? What will they decide? Um, and, and because of that, and you know, let's say your kids school uh, every day, they do some testing, sometimes they open, sometimes they close. It's, it's so much is out of our control. So trying to gain some control, I think is a really important exercise for these days. Uh, now, what, what can we control? Yeah, that was my next question. What can people exert control over? So, so for example, we can decide to exert control over our bedtime, right? It, I know, you know, on any particular night, it's, it's tempting to, to watch TV a little later, but control is important. Exercise. And if I would do exercise, I would do the kind of exercise that I would see improvement on. Like if you do plank or push-ups, you can see improvement. If you go for a walk, you can't see improvement. We can open savings accounts. And every Friday, put some money into that savings account. Every, every time we can make an action that we have control, yeah. shopping therapy, I'm not recommending shopping therapy, but shopping therapy is about control. These people used to own this headphones. Now I own these headphones. That's a, that's a way of control. It's an expensive way to get control, so I'm not recommending it, but getting some control is incredibly important. And in terms of loneliness, one, one question is, should we break you know, some of the, 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 the rules of COVID? And there's a cost here and there's a cost there. But if, you, if you're alone, if you're alone and you've been without company for 10 days and you meet somebody else that hasn't been with other people for 10 days, go ahead and meet. Right? I mean, I'm not saying go crazy risk, but, but loneliness is so important. It's such a, such a big part of our humanity that, that we need to do things to try and to overcome it. And if you don't want to meet somebody intimately, have a meeting in a park. There's a, there's a cycle of fear that I see happening where people have not seen anybody and the first step of seeing somebody seems so frightening that they don't but but we have to we have to get there safely and so on but but we have to get there so so i think i think investing socially um i'll tell you one of my tricks is that i try to have a, a virtual coffee or virtual wine with friends and i don't have it on my laptop I, I have it in a different chair or outside or on the sofa. So it feels social because right. in the setting that I'm in now, this is like work. I'm here, you know, 14 hours a day. I'm in front of this screen working. Everything about it reminds me of work. And if I want to be social, I don't want this. This is about getting things done, finished quickly, efficiently, you know, multiple screens. No, no, no. You want to be social. Take your iPad, laptop, uh, phone, whatever. Go to a different room. Sit on the sofa. Put your feet up. You you need to you need to change things. So, so all of those things. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people are having quarantine fatigue, and they're doing what you're talking about. Instead of quarantining with their spouse or immediate family, they have responsibly created a pod where they maybe have another family in their cul-de-sac or, you know, their grown kids who they know each other's pattern of quarantine. And after the certain number of days, they are able to get together and interact safely. And they still are responsible when they do it, particularly outside and things like that. I've seen it make a tremendous difference in breaking that fatigue cycle where they have some degree of normalcy while still being responsible and they do feel some control uh, a lot of curves are what's called diminishing sensitivity like you know they go like this like the first person you meet makes a huge difference the second person makes a smaller difference so at least 
take take some steps, uh, some steps to meet people, and you know, close proximity is better than uh, so safety, but then then make steps. And the thing is that once you get used to Zoom life, everything else looks like effort. I'm on Zoom. Go, let's meet on Zoom. No, no, put some effort. Walk to a bench. Uh, meet somebody uh, for coffee. Do do. It's more effort, and so many times we don't do the effort. But in this case, the effort will lead to better results. We just don't predict how much we need it. You know, loneliness is such a bizarre thing. It it actually everything that creates depression are things that we can't put our finger on. Oh, I feel right. low energy. Where is it coming from? I don't know exactly. And I can't say it's because I haven't hugged anybody for, for eight months. I, I, can't, I can't make that connection. Right. So what happened is that we have an over, overall you know, uh, fatigue, uh, depression, whatever it is. We don't know where it's coming from. Well, we do know, not individually, but we know that social connection is a big, is a big part of it. But our intuition doesn't tell us. We don't say, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little sluggish and... And slow, it must be that I'm missing some social connection. No, we, we don't know where it's coming from. But, but, but in the end, it says, I don't know where it's coming from, but I feel a little sluggish. I don't feel like putting an effort and going and meeting somebody. But that's exactly what we need to do. That's why I've always thought about depression as being an auto-exacerbating disease because it's like as you become depressed, you're more lethargic. And as you're more lethargic, you have psychomotor retardation and it's kind of like you're not going to get a hit if you're not swinging. So the fewer swings you take, the fewer chances you have for getting reinforcement. And the less reinforcement you get, the fewer swings you take. And the fewer swings you take, the even less reinforcement you get. So it's like you're circling the drain in ever concentric circles and you just your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think COVID is really exacerbating that for people that are prone to depression even if it's an endogenous depression, even if it's chemically based, this is like the perfect storm. If you've got somebody that is prone to depression, now we're stripping away all of their opportunity to have something that can break the cycle of depression by getting them excited or getting them passionate. This is the perfect storm for those people, which is why we're seeing such a spike in loneliness, depression, suicide, suicide attempts, anxiety, all of these things we've got to get out of this quarantine at some point and get back to the world. Yeah. And you know, it's a, what, what's very, very tough is that we, we see the, the immediate results of COVID. We see people who are sick. We see the people who are dying. The long-term consequences of, on mental illness, uh, we're just starting to start estimating them. So, so we're focusing on preventing the you know, in, infection rates uh, but but the, the cost of that by quarantine, for example, we, we don't understand. So we're paying, we're paying financially and we're playing with depression, but we don't know uh, how much we're really paying for this. No, and it's going to be years, maybe decades, for the full price of this to land. Certainly with first, second, and third grade children that are falling behind developmentally, this isn't going to come to full fruition for many years to come when they're less competitive with their peer group that didn't suffer that during those formative years, they're going to be less competitive in the job market. You know, there's some research that suggests because they're less competitive, they're going to take higher risk jobs, which means lesser health benefits. So they're less likely to get good health coverage, which years of life are going to be lost later on. I mean, the cost of this is not going to be felt for many, many years to come. And right now it's invisible, so nobody's talking about it. When I talk about it, it falls on deaf ears because it's like, we can't see it. Show me an x-ray. Can't see it broken right now, so let's talk about something else. Yeah, so we don't see it and we don't estimate it correctly. And it's tough to estimate it correctly. Um, I'll tell you one, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, mentioning a lot of depressing thing. I'll take you something positive on education. Good. So... Um, <laughs> So when, when COVID started, I, I did lots of studies on the education system and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And mostly it's terrible. But I, I saw a few spots of light. And the thing that I found that was so inspiring were that for the first time, there were kids that studied whatever they wanted. 
So when you had the combination of a principal, teacher, parent, and kid that knew what they wanted to study, they soared. So there was a, there was a kid who loved boats. Who knows why? But the kid loved boats. And they studied world history through boats. Great! There were kids who studied Python and the history of chess. And, 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 and the, thing, the thing I saw is I saw kids who, the moment they had autonomy, and they could decide. And, and school, we have to admit, it's like, you know, it's a regulated system and we tell them what to study and the odds are they're not interested. But when you are, are with them in a school, the teacher can force them to study something they're not interested. Sit straight, right. read your book, put your phone away. When they're home and they're on Zoom, they can turn you off. So all of a sudden, we need to get kids to have intrinsic motivation. And I, so one thing is we see some of those kids that are really just amazing, doing amazing stuff. But I'm also hoping that this will be a wake-up call for the education system to start saying, you know, I don't really care which part of history the kids learn. I want them to learn history. Let them pick. I don't care which books they, uh, like there's 7,000 books they could read, pick pick 50. I mean, I don't, I don't really care. And I'm hoping that we will take this advantage that now that we understood how important intrinsic motivation is and we will do some changes in the same way that we talked about the workplace and how important intrinsic motivation is, it's also important for education. Absolutely it is. And we can do it. But the moment everybody was in, in this goes back to the default. The moment, you know, school hasn't changed. I'm 53, I remember going to first grade. People said, oh, in a few years, school will be different. No, it's just the same. No, exactly. It's been a long time. time to change it. And, and maybe this is a good wake up call to, 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 to break that setup and start something much, much better. Yeah, what better time to do it than now when the model is shaken up anyway? So, yep. well, I've kept you a long time. And let me finish by asking a question that may be unanswerable other than in the most general of terms. But you've created a question in my mind, a real premise about our cognitive limitations and people's unwillingness and maybe inability to challenge their intuitions. And, you know, I, I do a lot of work with confirmation bias with regard to race and other things for that matter, but confirmation bias. Have you found a way to get people to question their intuitions, to question what they hold to be true, to at least test it like you did with your nurses? You know, they had the intuition, they had the belief that ripping off the Band-Aid fast was the best way to go, and you found out that, you know, that's not the case. Duration does not equal intensity in impact. So have you found a way to get people to challenge what they hold to be true when it may or may not be? So the answer is yes, in a limited way, for important decisions. And it, it goes back to choice architecture. For example, if we try to help people pick a home, and if we say to people, hey, go ahead and buy a home, what do people do? They go to the bank, they say, how much money can I, I borrow? They take that number and they go to the real estate agent and they, the real estate agent showed them a house that is slightly more expensive than one they can afford. They look at 10 and they pick one. And that's not an environment to challenge people's assumptions. But if you build a different tool and you don't start with this, but you start by asking people, what makes you happy? And then you say, if, if your mother-in-law came to visit every month for three days, would this make you happier or not? Do you want a guest room or not? Um, does looking for parking makes you happy or not? Do you have a seasonal affective disorder and therefore do you want different windows? Um, have, you, have you lived in a place where you could go in a walking distance to a supermarket? So. Anyway, the, the point is, I can tell you more about this, but the point is that if you don't design the interface differently, you're not going to get a different result. But I think the trick for us, for the people who are trying to design society in a better way, is to design decision aids that will do exactly that. Right? And, and if you ask people explicitly to consider what makes them happy, then after considering it and giving it an answer, 
they are going down the garden path that takes these things into account. You know, it's funny. In 1969, I was 19 years old, and I was speaking to a real estate convention about sales. And I asked people what they used as an assumption in approaching people about buying a house. And they said, well, women want to see kitchen and bedrooms. And we ask, you know, what do men want to see? They said, well, they want to see garage and backyard. And then we asked the buyers, and it was all over the chart. So I remember having a, we used overhead projectors in with grease pens. And I had a chart I laid down that said, if you're going to sell Bill what Bill buys, you better see things through Bill's eyes. So I was telling them, if a woman tells you that what's important to her about a house are trees, you better not show her the kitchen unless it's got a damn tree growing in it. And once they understood that, it's what you're talking about. Find out what it is that makes them happy in a home, what's important to them, and find out what they think is important, and then focus on that for those people Sales went up. They showed people what they wanted to see about a house instead of what they presumed they wanted to see about a house. And it made all the difference in the world. And I guess it still comes down to finding out what makes people happy and then meeting that need, need satisfaction selling. Yeah. And and the thing about this is that if you don't start by asking the right questions, you can't, you can't, you can't get it. So so if you think about choice architecture, the notion of choice architecture is that you get people to think in a different way about the problem. You show them different options. You uh, ask them different questions. There's a, I'm next to an Arab village, and I don't know if you can hear the shooting, but it's, not, it's shooting for happiness. There's probably a wedding. Uh, oh, good. I do hear no... shooting. I was wondering if you were, <laughs> I saw you look yeah, over yeah, your I'm right shoulder, attacked. I thought. It's just an Arab village uh, <laughs> close by, so... so uh, so, um, so, so, so the thing is, if you think about, you know, do people think naturally about the problem in the right way? The answer is no. And the question is, do we design things? And it could be a piece of paper with some, some questions. It could be a website. It could be an app, no matter what it is. But do we design things to bring other consideration into mind? Uh, you know, do we, when, when people are looking for a house, like think about, seasonal affective disorder. People with seasonal affective disorder don't naturally understand that they have seasonal affective disorder and don't naturally know that they should look for large windows. People don't understand that if they'll live close to a grocery store, they'll eat better because they'll go more times a week to the grocery store and eat Get more fresh, fresh fruits yeah. and vegetables. So we need, we need to understand where people fail and design the tool to support that. That is a great answer to the question, though, because I know it was a very broad, almost unanswerable question, but your answer is saying we need to get them to pose the question to themselves differently. What is it that makes me happy? What is it that I really want? And they aren't asking themselves that question because they are defaulting and choosing from what they're shown instead of what they want. And so they have to do that. I've done some patient advocacy work before, and I've tried to get people to say, instead of going to the doctor and listening to what he or she tells you, make a list of what you want to know before you go in there. Be prepared. Ask your questions. They're working for you. Ask your questions. Make a list so you don't freeze up at the time and get it answered. And their satisfaction of the visit and their relationship with the doctor goes way up because their needs get met because they pre-planned and got what they wanted. Made a huge difference. That's right. So let me give you a, a kind of my, my metaphor for this. And my metaphor compares the physical world to the mental world. So if you think about the physical world, uh, we have made tremendous progress over the last two, 300 years. Uh, think about the chair you're sitting on. It probably has a cushion that somebody developed and it has wheels and it has armchairs. Somebody has taken our imperfection of our physical body and created the technology around it to make it easier for us to sit for a long time. Uh, we've built planes, we've built uh, cars, we've built heaters, coolers. I mean, just amazing, right? Superman doesn't need any of those. We need. What about the mind? When it comes to the mind, we often assume that people are a Superman of the mind. 
that we can do anything. Like, you know, you don't go to somebody and say, be cold resistant. No, we build heaters. And the same thing is what we need for the mind. We can't assume that people are perfect. Let people just figure out how to repay their mortgage or what house to buy or what medical treatment to get or how to sleep better. What we need to do is to create tools like a chair. A chair is a tool that takes our imperfect body and makes it comfortable to sit for a long time. What is the chair for getting us to not fight with our spouse over money? Right. What is the, the, the equivalent that of helping us to choose the right vacation spot and the, the right way to spend our money to maximize happiness? We need those tools. And, and right now we're kind of assuming that everybody can do it on their own. I think that's not true. I'm sure that's not true. So, so we need to develop those. Now we're starting to develop them, but there's a long way to go. Yeah, but that's why you exist, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what, uh, what gets me excited. Yeah, that's what gets you passionate. Well, Dan, I could talk to you for hours, and I've kept you too long already. This has been absolutely intriguing. You take these things and you break them down where people can really understand them and say, here's how I can apply this in my own life. And that's just tremendous. I know it's late in your part of the world. So thank you for accommodating us. And I hope you and I can talk again very soon. I, I would love that. It was delightful. And I'll mention one other thing. I, I'm trying to think these days about what opportunities we should say yes to and what opportunities we should say no to. You know, somebody is asking you for a favor, somebody is offering you a, you know, a job. But like in general, how do we say yes? What should we say yes to and what should we say no to? Now, I don't have a good framing around it yet, but if at some point you want to talk about that topic. Well, I would love to talk about that topic because I talk to people about how to manage their relationships. Like, for example, people don't know how to get away from a talker that they just mm -hmm. pop, 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 won't ever end. They don't know how to manage their relationships. They don't know how to say no if people ask to borrow money or their yeah, car yeah, yeah. or to come over for dinner when they don't want to come over or will you help me move or will you help me this or that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you have no idea how relevant what you're talking about is to some of the things that, that I've been focusing on and doing. This would be terrific to talk about. Okay, so so let's uh, let's think about uh, having having that discussion on that topic. I think it's a really interesting topic, and um, I need to think a little bit more about it. But then I'll be happy to to chat on. Yeah, let's do because I, I think that in managing people's lives that way, and that comes down to managing their time. I do think people don't realize the personal power they have to say no. And then they pass up opportunities that they should say yes to. And it comes down to, again, like what makes you happy and what doesn't make you happy. And I'm astounded that you brought that up because that's really intriguing and something that I get asked a lot about by our viewers when I say, what is it you want us to talk about? What do you want us to do shows about? It's those kind of things. And it starts all the way from family to extended family and in-laws, to people at work and across the board. So this is very, very relevant. Love to talk about it some way. We can talk about it on the side, and then we can figure out some way to explore it together. That'd be great. That would be great. Very good. All right. Well, okay. listen, have a nice evening, and we'll talk very soon. Very good. Looking forward to it. Thank Bye you, Dan. Now.